Morning, gorgeous. Today we are talking about billing in Halo PSA. Now, as simple as billing can be in Halo PSA, it's also very complicated. I know, what a interesting opening statement. Um, today I really want to talk about billing and contracts and just kind of give you some high-level insights into how it all clicks together and things you want to be conscious of when you're building billing in Halo PSA. Whether you're a consultant implementing Halo PSA or you're just a user submitting time in Halo PSA, having that intrinsic understanding of what it is you're doing and what impact it can have is very, very important. So let's jump into it and let me give you a deep dive today in all of the things that impact billing inside your environment. Good day, my name's Connor Fagan and we are Renata Solutions and today we're talking about billing inside of Halo PSA and tracking time and how that all links together and what it all means. So in front of you right now, you can see a report that I use a lot to really start auditing bills when we work with new partners to understand what their tickets are actually saying to me as the person who's going to take over their build so we know not to fuck with anything really that's going to impact that. So I'll kind of go through this to give you some insight of what we're going to cover today, but a few things to understand, I suppose. So when we're doing something in Halo on a ticket or whatever it may be, we can log our actual time, right? So if I've said I've done three minutes doing a thing, that is my actual time I have spent doing the thing. Then you can have the billable or the non-billable time on the ticket, right? So we can have a charge rate of remote support and that is either billable or not billable um, to the ticket and we can override that at a ticket level so we can say these tickets are never billable right now I'm not saying invoiceable this will get complicated but I'm saying billable right so we could say that we do 15 minutes of remote support and that's billable for this ticket type we'll go over what that means soon and then non-billable and what you can also have is no charge now yes no charge is non-billable but actually, in my head, it sits in its own little box. We're saying we're not going to charge for this time. I don't care if it's billable or not. We're not going to charge for it. And I'll come full circle as to what that means. Then we have billable time with adjustments and non-billable time with adjustments. What this means is if we have rounding applied to our actions or our tickets, it will show the adjustment time. So if I have three minutes of billable time, but we actually round our billable time to 15 minutes, the adjustments in here will show... 15 minutes or 12 minutes, depending on how you want to display it, of adjusted billable time. I think in this build it will show us 15 minutes, right? So we can see how much actual time we're doing versus what we're going to bill or invoice the client, okay? Then we have contract hours. So this is basically any billable time logged against the contract. Um, it has to be billable, non-billable time won't go against the contract. I'll double explain what these mean in a minute. We have contract overage, so if you do run a prepay agreement or a you know four hours a month contract, any overage will show on a ticket as contract overage. Then we have pay as you go, so this is all billable time that we're going to invoice to the client, so that's pay as you go. And then we have tickets or actions that are ready to invoice, how much we have invoiced out of that ticket. Right. And then we have at the end billable travel hours, non-billable travel hours, and also a prepay column if I need to see how much time is getting logged against prepay. So a lot of moving pieces, right? So where does this all begin? How do you start understanding kind of this data set in your Halo build, right? Well, if we take it to the very core basics of, of Halo, right? What we do is we have a ticket, right? And for the most of you, or the most part, tickets are what we're going to be referring to, right? And when we have a ticket, we can do an action, right? So this is me doing an action, okay? And I can say that I've done five minutes of remote support and I can press save. So I've done five minutes here of remote support. Now, this says here billable hours. So it says we're going to bill them 15 minutes, right? Or um, we're going to bill the client that. Now, if they had a contract, it would say here contract hours, and the importance of this is the fact that, yes, remote support has a rate against it, but we can override that at the ticket level to say we never invoice or this time isn't actually billable to the client in any way. So if I go to the incident ticket type, what we have here, if I edit defaults, I believe it is, 
We can say default for the ticket labor field is billable, yes or no. Default for the products are billable, yes or no. So if I untick that, default for ticket labor is billable, and go back to that ticket, whichever one it was, this one here, and recalculate the billing, and it's still showing me the hours of 15 minutes because although we've updated the ticket type, it doesn't go back through existing tickets and make them not billable. OK, again, that was my brain falling off its shoulder. So if I untick this box. And then it will automatically recalculate if you have that enabled, if not recalculate. What you'll see then here is no billable hours are being displayed. However, if you click on the billable tab, it will still show your contract or billable time is 15 minutes, even though this is never going to be caught against an agreement and is never going to show up for billable to the client, because that is the difference between billable and non billable. OK, so that's the first thing, right? So we can have a ticket and we can override per ticket if it's billable or non billable. So so charge rates that would normally be billable against the contract or, or just prepay or pay as you go. Billable or not, we can override that per ticket type. OK, so when you're reporting on this, it's really important you know what is or what isn't billable. Projects is a great example. 99% of the times, I might want to know what my engineers are doing, if it's remote or on site, but I never want to invoice that to the client because I invoice them ahead of time. So I'll make the ticket type not billable, but then I can report on how much remote support we did on this project versus on site. There's many conversations about that, but I'll just leave that there for now. So that's the first thing to consider is if the ticket is billable or not. I've selected it and it is now with billable. So the second thing to understand here is that I am using the remote support charge rate and it says 15 minutes. Well, why is it said 15 minutes, Connor? Well, that's because in configuration and billing under charge types, we have our charge rates and here I have remote support. And what I say in remote support is um, the rate is 100 pounds or 100 whatever currency you're in dollars an hour. And I want the minimum minutes to always be 15 minutes, either per action or per ticket. We'll go over that in a second. So 15 minutes here. And if I go over 15 minutes, I want to incrementally increase that either up or down. So you can round up or round down. So if I do 16 minutes on a ticket and it's round up only, I will always bill for 30 minutes. OK, hope that's clear. If I did round up and down and I put in here 30 minutes, right, minimum, and then I want to round up in 30 minute increments. Well, if I do 44 minutes on a ticket, it's always going to round that down to 30 minutes. If I do 46 minutes, that will always round it up. So 44 will round down, 46 will round up. 45, I think you're kind of on the teeter between what seconds it is. But anyway, that's tangential. So you're going to round up and round down, right? For the most part, I recommend only rounding up. However, Depending on how you build your clients, you might want to consider rounding up or down. Then we have on our charge rates our multipliers. So if we do an action on a ticket outside of our working hours, let's say nine to five, it will 2x that time that is out of hours. So if it's a 4 p.m. till 5 p.m. I did an hour, that's going to bill them for an hour, right? If I did between 5 and 6 p.m. an hour, it's going to bill them two hours for the overage plus the hour in hours. So we're going to bill them three hours. OK, so again, it's not going to multiply the entire ticket. It's just going to multiply the time you did out of hours. Same applies to multiplier, same uh, holiday multiplier and contract multiplier. For the most part, when I build, I will always do an out of hours charge rate rather than let this do it automatically, because it may be you work 10, 15 minutes later quite frequently or your team do. And, you know, you might have flexi shifts. So they can start a bit later if they end a bit later, right? Um, and you might not want to have to be troubleshooting all the time fixing that. However, on the rare occasions where you do want to bill out of hours, have that as a manual field selection for me on charge rate is a viable option. OK, so we have the remote support rate and we have in here the rate of that and minimum minutes and incremental minutes. So if I go back to that ticket here, I can see here it says build hours. Well, why is it build hours, Connor? How do you know it's not against the contract or it's going into infinity or whatever? The bit to understand on this is whenever you do an action on a ticket, it's going to check the company or customer billing plan combinations to decide what to do with it. OK, so if I go over here to TRNCN1, which is our dev build and go down, we have this billing plan combinations. OK. And within here, what we can do is we can set a multitude of things, basically. But the thing to, to note 
is what you're doing with the billing plans. So you can have it go pay as you go. You can have it against the contract if you have one. You can have it go to prepay, right? If you have a prepay agreement or prepay in the system, you can have it go there. Or you can have it don't invoice. Now, if you have it don't invoice, what we're actually setting at the ticket level or what's happening to the ticket here is we're saying to the ticket, the ticket isn't billable. When in fact it is billable, we're just not invoicing for it because it's included within something. So what I would recommend is we capture that time against something so we know where the time is going so we can report on it later. The reason being is, and there's a million ways to skin a cat with this, but for me, I want to run a report on all of our billable versus non-billable time versus how much no charge we've done. So non-billable could be projects, it could be internal tasks, it could be a multitude of things, right? I want them to be not billable, but I can track it. And then our billable, I want to track against contracts or prepay or whatever we need so we can look at that split. How much billable versus non-billable time are we doing? No charge, what I typically recommend we leverage, is when you're basically saying I'm giving you free time to the client, right? So let's say they have a printer that's faulty, but it takes me four hours to fix it because I don't know what I'm doing, right? We're not going to invoice the client always for four hours. You might invoice them one hour of remote support and then put three hours on there, no charge, saying, oh, this took longer than we thought we was going to do. It turned out to be blah, 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 blah. But at least you're logging your time of three hours so we have it so we can report on it later and breathe for a second. Quick recap. So we have a ticket, we have a charge rate, and the charge rate has a value on it of, let's say, £100 or $100. And on there, we have minimum minutes up or down. And when we log that, it looks at the client and looks at their charge rates. And depending on what we select in here, so site, ticket type, category, multitude of things, will determine where that ticket goes in the system or what it's logged against, i.e. a contract, i.e. pay as you go. Now, you can also override that £100 an hour down here with overriding charge types, which again is something you need to be conscious about. So in here, you could say whenever we do remote support for this client, it's £200. And you can build this out here and say £200. However, if you build an agreement for a client and say for the next year you get remote support for, I don't know, let's say telephony, and you only want to bill them £50 an hour for it, what you can't do is say in the overriding charge rate here, remote support for telephony is only £50. We don't have that control in here to do that. What you can do, though, in an agreement level, if I just pick TRNCM1, and I could do this VoIP special rate, we could say they get um, no hours per period, so everything that comes in here is billable. However, you can override the charge rate here at the agreement level and say, if it hits this agreement, then override it. Well, how would we do that? Well, you could have remote support. So as of the 1st of July, the rate is 50 pounds and we override it to be 50, 15 minimum, 15 increments. And what we can say here under billing plan combinations is whenever we do a ticket with the work type of telephony support, right? Log it against this agreement. So when I go back to the client, and look at their billing plan combinations down here, what I can see is that whenever we do VoIP, VoIP tickets, because telephony support is included, it's going to be the VoIP special rate. To demonstrate, I could go to service desk. I could make a quick ticket for TRNNC1. I could make it telephony. I could triage it as whatever, don't know, oh, perhaps if I actually pick something, here we go. So um, telephony is selected. I can then close this ticket with one hour of remote support, like so, and you're seeing billing that we are billing for an hour. I can then go to invoicing, awaiting review. Sorry, I had end user closure confirmation on, so it wasn't appearing. But what I can do is go to awaiting review, contract overage, because they have a contract, but it's gone over there zero hours. I can say, yes, I want to invoice that. And then I can go down here to 1470, create an invoice, and hopefully this will show me £50 because it's hit the agreement, it's applied the override, and should hopefully be £50 in here, which it is. So again, you can get quite creative when you're talking about billing to have overrides at a contract level rather than at a blanket customer level if we need to have special rates for special things. Okay. Now, 
I mentioned earlier about action and ticket level billing as well, because some people or some companies build very differently. Again, really important to understand when you're setting up your Halo and going through all of this. So if we go to config billing general settings and invoice creation, what we have here is charge type settings and we can do calculate charge rounding at the ticket level or if we untick it, what we're doing is we're calculating our charge at the action level. Um, what that basically means is, is if I make a new ticket for here, for TRNCN1, for network support, and I triage it as this, and I add a comment now. Let me just add an asset. One day I'll fix this, I promise. And I add five minutes to remote support. What you can see is it's 15 minutes. If I add another one, though, for another five minutes, what you'll see now is it says billable hours is 10 minutes. Well, why the hell has it done that, Connor? Well, because we have rounding at the ticket level, it's basically saying we want to always round all of the time to 15 minute increments. OK, so because I've done two things here with remote support, it's basically adding them both together. Right. And it's saying, right, 10 minutes. Cool. That's total time. So we need to do an additional five minutes. Right. So the way Halo works, this is a little bit backwards in my head, but I get it, is it basically says for the action before it, just post the original time. So because I've logged five minutes, just say it's five minutes billable. And then the next action runs the math. So what you'll see in here is that if I go to time tracking, you'll see the rounding adjustment is five minutes because we've already had two five minute actions. And we need an extra five somewhere, right? So then it does a rounding here of five minutes. OK. So then we end up with billing of 15 minutes. Now, if you went to config billing and did it at the action level, what you're saying is, is that every action on the ticket needs to be rounded to 15 minutes itself rather than at a ticket level. So if I just recalculate billing on this ticket super quick, what you'll see now is that both tickets are rounded to 15 minutes and we are billing for, if I refresh, 30 minutes total time. And again, these small tick boxes can have such a massive impact on your billing. And what you'll notice under each action is there is a rounding adjustment per action of 10 minutes. And again, what you'll see is billable because the ticket is billable rather than it being overridden to non-billable, which for me is something completely different. If we didn't have an agreement capture in the time, it would also show ready for invoicing once closed. Again, another checkbox to be conscious about. If you did allow the option to invoice for tickets that are in progress or not closed, that would be checked at this point. Um, and again, there's loads of other things to deep dive into at some point. You'll also see the billable total, so it will tell you how much in dollars, pounds you're actually going to be billing for that action on that ticket. Um, so again, there's a ton of data in here really worth deep diving into at a later date. Just going to set that back super quick. So that's enabled again now. I want to do it at the ticket level. This is what I see in 99% of builds as we build for the ticket, not for each action on the ticket. Okay. So quick recap. We have a ticket. We do things on the ticket, either you know remote support on site. We leverage our charge rates, OK? Um, when we do that, it then looks at the client. So this client here looks at the billing and then looks at this billing plan combinations to know where to route the ticket. Is it pay to go? Is it prepay, et cetera, et cetera? When it then points to that agreement, we can then say with the agreement, in this case, that they get no hours uh, included a month. So everything that hits this agreement is billable. This is yearly for some reason, but whatever, um, is always billable. And then we want to override any tickets that are caught by this agreement. So any telephony support tickets, hit this, and then I'm overrided to £50. Okay. Um, something else to know is when we're talking about um, all you can eat agreements, okay? And I'm going to make one here for TRNCM1, generate a reference, doesn't matter. We'll just call this all you can eat. I can then say I want to include everything to be encapsulated by this agreement. So I call agreements time encapsulation because that's what they're really doing is rather than billing for it, they're encapsulating that time against the agreement. And again, what you can do is you can add the charge rates in here and say what you want to capture, right? So I could say any remote support is caught by this agreement and any on-site support is caught by this agreement. And you can get, you know, 
if you're certain category, etc., you can do any time or with inside or outside of working hours, but that's a video for another day. So we can say we're going to log all of that time to this agreement. The problem is, and I'm doing this on purpose, is the fact that we haven't considered here our sequence. Now, if you're quite a you know bog standard MSP where you only have one agreement per client, you don't have any overrides, you know, it's it's no complex billing, this works for you almost all the time and it's so easy to do. However, if I just go back to the customer TRRNCN1, what you have to always remember is the priority or the hierarchy of the billing plan combinations. These billing plan combinations are sequential, meaning they work from top to bottom and go through it in order. Now, in this case, we've got lucky because I made this one physically first. And although it's the same sequence as on-site support, it appears top of the list. However, if I was to be a bit facetious and just make this number two, what you'll now see in here is that it is underneath the first one. So what this means is when a ticket looks at this client's billing plan and it works through each line in sequence, it's actually never going to hit this one because we've said all on-site support is caught by this agreement and all remote support is hit by this agreement. So a slight faux bar there in what I just said. But if you ever do any on-site telephony support, it's never going to hit the telephony agreement because it's going to be caught by this one. However, if you do any remote support, it will be caught by this agreement because sequentially it's higher up in the list. So when you start getting into this level of complexity, this is when I recommend leveraging billing templates, which is a nice transition into billing templates. So just a quick recap before we do so, if you are quite basic and you just have a single client with a single contract and you build out the list of things on their billing, com billing plan combinations within here, so you can say this, this will work for you perfectly fine, rinse and repeat, away you go great. When you start adding in tangential things, what you don't want to be doing is building these out at the agreement level because the hierarchy of them at the client level is very, very, very important. And if you then start doing this and having to go and edit these, this is now when I would always steer a customer into billing templates. So what are billing templates, Connor? You're talking a lot. There's a bunch of things going on. Well, billing templates is if you go to billing, you'll have to turn them on if they're not there over here. It's billing templates. It's essentially what I've just said. Okay. So you can make here um, your example template or we'll make one together. And we could call this or you can eat customer plus uh, VoIP override okay and we can build this out super quick so i can say if we ever do any telephony support i want to go to a contract and then you have to think about contract types so going back over to agreements if i just make a new one one of the things you can set when you're doing it is the contract type or the agreement type this usually when i'm building for clients isn't super important if we've only got 50 agreements in here and they're all managed service it's quite vital if we're doing different types of agreements. Maybe we have VoIP and ISP or lease line agreements and managed service so we can report on it. But then if we leverage that in billing templates, this becomes quite powerful. So what we're just going to do very quickly is go to uh, contracts and agreements. If I could see it on my screen, agreements, scroll down to uh, contract types. And here, I'm just going to rename this to be or you can eat IT support. Prefix doesn't really matter. And we'll change this one to telephony. Uh, telephony, that'll do. And there we go, right? So we now have two different um, agreement types. So when we're then building out our billing templates, we can leverage these to say, if we have a contract with this thing, go over here. If we have a contract with this thing, go over here, about X, Y, and Z. So if I just go back to my billing templates and we'll make a new one and call this YouTube billing template. What we can do is a few things. We can say, right, I want to make sure that whenever I do any um, telephony support, that it goes to a contract that's defined as telephony. I want to make sure that when we do any remote support, it goes to the all you can eat contract. I want to make sure when you do any um, on site support, it goes to the contract of. Um, or you can eat, right? So we're starting to build out these rules here. But the good thing about this is if you then decide, you know, we apply this to our clients and decide later down the line, actually, what we want to make sure we do is whenever we do any 
project work, right? So whenever we do the ticket, ITIL ticket type of project, what we want to make sure we do is we put that somewhere else. I'm just going to do an example of don't invoice for a minute. Now, again, what we have to consider here is the sequence. So what I recommend when doing these is, is I always build these out in multiples of 10. And you'll, if you ever come across one of my builds and out there in the wild, you will see this. So I'm just going to do this as multiples of 10 just for a minute. And then we will restructure these in a second. So we have four things. So you need to understand what's going to clash and what isn't. And this isn't an easy thing in the world to do. Well, because this is a don't invoice, I want to make sure this is always at the top. So I'm just going to make this, you know, number one, right? We have we have enough room underneath that and that's fine. And then you want to make sure the next one is a telephony support, because again, we don't want anything to catch this before telephony support. However, if we're doing project work, that's fine. Capture it against don't invoice. And then when we look at remote support and on site support, we want those to be a court against those contracts there. And if it doesn't match any of these, we want it to go as pay as you go. You can create an agreement if none exists. However, that's just going to make a single agreement, which isn't really going to work in this scenario. So I'm going to keep everything else of here just left alone. Okay. The good thing about these are is that when you apply it to your customer and let's say you change it, you can actually change it in bulk down the line. But we'll go through that in a second. So if I just go over to agreements, I know we need a telephony agreement and an all you can eat agreement for this client. So if I go to agreements over here, I can see I've got this VoIP special rate, but I need to make sure the contract type is telephony. And what I want to make sure I do on this all you can eat one is make sure our contract type is all you can eat. What you can then do is go to the customer, go down to billing and you can apply a template. And what you should notice is it adds in all of those things in the right order and it will match it against the billing plan agreements if they exist. If they don't exist and it says create a contract, you want to stop this, go and make the agreement or contract and then apply it again. But what this means though now is depending on what we do on the ticket, it will be routed to the correct agreements. So if we just start with something simple, so TRNCM1, and we make this actually a project triage is fine like this, submit it. And I set this up as a migration of at least it's five to go. It don't really matter. So if I then go here, add in a project note of 15 minutes of remote support. What I should see on this now when I edit it is that actually this is classed as not billable. So I mentioned earlier about things being billable versus non-billable. Well, they should have matched that agreement and or billing plan combination. Sorry, and gone. Yep, we don't invoice for any project, so make it as not billable, right? So again, it's important to note this. If you are doing that, don't invoice, or you're you know saying on the ticket it's not billable that this is actually what it's doing is removing that flag basically. Okay, so that one is perfectly fine, good as gold. If we then do another ticket for an incident for TRNCM1. And I say this is IT support, doesn't really matter. And just select something here. If I triage it and add in the fact that this is a remote support job and do test and press save. What we should notice is this is contract hours, which is fantastic. And to validate what contract that is going against, you can press the dots and go down to time tracking and you can see the billing plan or the contract ID that you're capturing it against. If though I change this work type to telephony support and you'll notice here all you can eat is unlimited and VoIP is currently zero. If I edit this and now go back to it here, you should now see it change to VoIP special rate. Now that changed automatically because I have a setting on to do that. I'll show you that in a minute. But the purpose is, is that our billing plans are working correctly because depending on what we're doing, depending on, on the ticket type or the fields, it is routing that to the correct places. So you'll now see it's billable 15 hours because it is telephony support. If I put it back to IT support, you'll see this little whirr in the top right and it will change to contract hours and then point to the right agreement. And you'll notice that although we're not invoicing for IT support because it's included, right? It's against the contract. The ticket is still marked as billable because it's billable work, right? 
Um, whether or not we invoice for it is tangential because it's caught by a contract, but they are paying for that contract. That's kind of the difference in that one there. If though I was to do a comment and say no charge and do test, what you'll see is that it's not logged against anything because no charge isn't. It kind of goes into like an ether of a black hole. And you'll see it is billable. However, no charge is never caught against the contract or anything. It's kind of just lost in the time and you have to report on it um, as its own thing. You can report on how long a ticket took. Um, I just mean in terms of breaking it out. So again, super important to note. This will, the contract, so if I go over to this all you can eat and look at the periodic history, it will show me 15 minutes of log time even though I did two minutes or whatever of no charge because no charge isn't caught against the agreement. Okay, so again, something to bear in mind and be conscious about when you're reporting and doing your likes in Halo PSA. And that video has been long and there's a lot to digest there. Um, so that's basically it from me, I think, for now in terms of this overview. So things to understand is that we have a ticket. The client is what's the priority of what's billed or not. If you're super simple, doing it at the agreement level is perfectly fine in my opinion. And you can say, yes, go to this agreement or don't go to this agreement. However, once you're getting built up in these complicated ways, you want to start leveraging billing templates. Never set a default contract and um, build out these billing templates. And the benefit of doing that is because they're getting slightly more complicated, they may change. It's the fact you can go to this, you can edit it and make changes and then update all your customers in bulk who have this template to reflect your new way of working. And that is it. That is a deep dive into my brain of how I approach billing in Halo and all the things we must consider all the time when doing things. The last little note today, if you were curious, um, I have the box ticked here, update all billing fields when changing ticket type, category or customer. That is why when I was changing the category, the ticket was recalculating again, because that is what that does. Whew. So that is billing. There's a lot to think about when you're doing it. There's even more to think about when you're a consultant going and trying to fix it. You've got to bear in mind you don't screw over a company's data set. But hopefully this will give you some high level understanding of all the things you can and can't do in there. And hopefully this will set you straight in the future. So my name is Conor Fagan. Have a beautiful day and I'll see you all soon. Bye bye.